in their worship. Something different in their way of worshiping the Father. And he sees that there are idols. He sees that there are idols. Um, an idol at, that he sees is that there was images and they had an altar prepared so they'd have, they'd have multiple things up here on the altar and then they'd have a spot they'd have a spot that, that said to an unknown God. So what did that really mean if, if, if you were a worshiper and you were setting and you came into a, to a service and you've seen their setting of different things on the, on the altar, and then there was this spot that said, to an unknown God. And I, I really believe that that's where, that's where a lot of people are today. They're in this spot of an unknown God. We understand the story about Jesus, so therefore we have the knowledge of, but we don't necessarily understand the story about Jesus. The story about Jesus that we, we truly receive is the forgiveness of sins and that He died for us and that you know he, we're, we're okay because of that if we believe. But there's so much deeper that God wants to become known. He, 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 he doesn't want to be unknown anymore. He doesn't want to be known about. He wants to be known. And in that area, I think we struggle with, with certain things. What stands out to me would be in Hebrews 6, where... It's that area of He's the hope that is the anchor for our souls. Many of us have storms in life. Do you know that there will be not one storm in heaven? Not one. We'll have storms in life, but even when Jesus was on the boat and there was a storm... And the disciples went to wake him up to calm the storm. Do you realize that he was within them? So in each one of us, there's a storm, but God is within us. So don't pull the anchor. Don't pull the anchor up. Because when we do that, we, we're, we're casting away hope. What I'm trying to say here is that we need to come into an area of deepening our worship by setting our anchor down. And He is the hope. The hope that runs through us is the Holy Spirit that He's given us. And we're going to see things differently. And we're going to hear things differently. When Lauren came up here to grab some Kleenexes, I don't know what he did that for, but I was just reminded of when the power of God was moving so strong in the early awakenings, something happened to Lauren to where God started to change him. God started to change multiple people, but Lauren stood out to me today because I remember his family gave a testimony of, of what's happened to Grandpa. That's the power of God. See, God, God started to become known to Lauren. He wasn't unknown anymore. When the power of God starts to transform your life, isn't that what we sang? Transform your life, God becomes known. And that's what I, I think for a believer, when that takes place, there's something that we need to start proclaiming. So let's see, what, let's see what Paul says in chapter 17 in Acts. If you want to follow along, that would be great. In all honesty, 
I don't necessarily do that because I get lost. But what does he say? I'm going to find where I need to go. Let's just start reading in. Uh, let's just start reading in sixteen. It says while Paul was waiting for, for them at in Ath- in Athens. He was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, What is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, He seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the, of the Areopagus where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. In the King James they use the word superstitious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I am going to proclaim to you. This is what he says. I I think that we need to really grasp a hold of this because this is what every believer needs to hear. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And He is not served by human hands as if He needed anything. Rather, He Himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. What's Paul, what's, what's Paul planting here? He's planting faith. He's planting faith. This is who God has been revealed to Paul. Just like Josie, your testimony this morning. It spoke of the power of God. That God has shown you something. He's transformed your life. He's transformed you and your marriage. So that you can plant wisdom. From one man he made all nations, that they would inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. This is Abraham. God did this so that he would seek him. God did this so that they would seek him. God did this so that they would seek him. That's important. Deepen our worship. Greater intimacy with Him. And perhaps reach out for Him. And find Him. Though He is not far from any of us. See, Paul's stating this. Where is God? Where is God for Paul? He's within Him. He has His Holy Spirit. I heard a message that a young uh, fella had the children up here and they asked the children, where, where, where is God? 
Oh, well, he's in heaven. One of the little children said, yeah. But heaven is far, far away. No. No. That's not true. When you become a child of God, you become part of heaven. And it's called the heavenly realms. To where the next verse states what we do there in the heavenly realms. He says, for in Him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are His offspring. We are His offspring. God has birthed me. God has birthed Josie. We heard a powerful part of His testimony. God has birthed Lauren. God's birthed the Apostle Paul. To do what? Make God known. Make God known. God wants to be so known. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone. You can't make Him and you can't buy Him. An image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now He commands all people everywhere to repent. For He has set a day when He will judge the world with justice by the man He has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising Him from the dead. One of the neatest areas of, of uh, mercy onto God's people, I think, is when God, you know, when Jesus said, you know, he had, he, he had told his disciples that, I'm, you know, I'm going to leave you, and where, I, where, where I'm going, you cannot come. But I will go and prepare a place for you. But in the meantime... I'm going to send you the Father's Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, and He'll lead and guide you, and He'll counsel you, and He'll comfort you. He gave them reassuring words. So when Jesus went to the cross, and He was staked, after He was brutally beaten and marred, for us, they took Him down, after he died, but before he died, he forgave the people that beat him. You know, he forgave the people that did all those harmful things to him. Setting us an example to do the same. He placed him in a tomb. And then the tomb became empty. So Jesus fulfilled the scripture. But God was so merciful that Jesus began to walk among the people in a way that they'd never seen him before. To give them further hope of what's to come. Even though he didn't look the same, but the power of God once changed him again. Jesus Christ was a man. Actually, Jesus was a man. Anointed by the Holy Spirit to do what? Fulfill scriptures. Each one of us are men. Women, you came from men. You didn't come from dust. You came from man. To do what? Fulfill scripture. To be witnesses to make God known. He's not unknown. He's not unknown. How do we make Him known? By understanding purpose. What is our purpose? <laughs> to make God known. That's why He's given us a testimony. That's why He's given us a testimony. Each one of us have a testimony. Knowledge puffs up. 
You can study and 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 go on and on and on. You can put it in and get 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 it get in. But if it don't come out, what good is it? This is what I see for the church. I see the church expanding. Not just here, at wide. I see the church expanding. I see new ones coming in that have just received the knowledge of Jesus. So really he's unknown. But I also see that there's a setting of people within the church that are going to have something different take place in them. Even though that they've known the knowledge of Jesus for a number of years that he's going to become more known. Why? Because God's going to deepen our worship. God's going to deepen our worship. We're not going to be able to get in the way. He wants us to get out of the way. He says, I'm about to do something. Why? So in Him we can live. In Him we can move. And in Him we can have His being. His being. We've got to find it. We've got to find it. Jump over to Ephesians 3. Let's just start. Okay. Let's just start reading in, in, in the first verse of three, and it says, it, it, "My Bible is titled God's Marvelous Plan for the Gentiles." It says, "For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of the gent- of you Gentiles, surely I have heard about the administration of God's grace that ha- that was given to me for you. That is the mystery." made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly, in reading this, then you will, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations as it was now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in in Christ Jesus. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of His power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me, to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ, and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Who are the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms? They're the demonic powers. They're the demonic powers. According to His eternal purpose that He accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in Him and through faith in Him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. For the reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, I pray that out of His glorious riches He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ 
And know this, love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. How do we serve God? We serve God out of love. But how do we understand love? By understanding the love that was poured out through the cross of Christ. How do we, how do we really see that? By understanding, number one, it was probably, and it's still probably, a, a, a tough area for myself, and that's understanding patience. Patience that God had for me to become who he is designing me to be. So that's how I have to see other individuals. So what am I going to say to them? Well, you should have known better. (laughs) I heard that all growing up. It didn't do me any good. If I was to ask you who the most famous person you ever met was, a high percentage would not say Jesus. They'd have a movie star or some athlete or some great author. Why? Is God... Man, it's weighty on me. I don't know if it is you guys, but it is me. Is is God that unknown to us? That we can't admit to somebody, hey, who's the famous person you met? Man, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. What do you know about him, man? Just let me tell you. Let me tell you. This is what he's showing me. This This is what he's done. I've I've seen I've seen things. You know, that's what moves people. God then becomes known. He becomes known. We can kick these other things off the altar. Yeah. Why? Because they collect dust. We want to clean them. We want to be cleaned. I believe also, like it says in John 15, that that we're in we're in the pruning season, where God wants to clean us. He gave me a vision last Sunday that I had seen this branch, and this branch had 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 fruit on it, but there was also some branches on that branch, some limbs that, that were broken and they were just hanging there. And, and God just, He wants to come along in our lives and he wants, to take those, he wants to take those branches that are just hanging there producing nothing and He wants to just take them off. He wants to just take them off. If you've ever trimmed dead limbs off of a tree, you'll notice that the tree will become fuller. Turn to John 15 once. Why is this going to happen for the church? Just keep that question. Why is this going to happen for the church? Why is God going to prune us? In the King James, if you have a King James Bible, they do not use the word prune. They use the word purge. So the word purge actually means to clear of imputed guilt. Well, if I'm looking at that, the first thing I'm thinking of is, what the heck does imputed mean? So I looked up imputed, and it's to charge a person with fault. Okay? What does the enemy do for us? What does our flesh counteract to the Spirit of God? They give us a false accusation of who we are. So what is, we want, what is he going to do? He's going to purge us. He's going to clear us. The church needs to be cleared of imputed guilt. 
God wants to clear, our, clear that from us, that, we, that we're not held accountable for, for what the enemy is trying to lie to us. So he prunes us. Why? Let's just start reading in one. I am the true vine, and my father, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. And simply, you can go back to Matthew 15 on that. He cuts off, and it just states that every seed that was not planted by my Father will be pulled out by the roots. That's what his word says. Every seeds are what? Every seeds that are not planted, anger, bitterness, which causes unforgiveness. They're all the acts of the flesh you'll find in Galatians. While every branch that does bear fruit... He prunes, he cleans. Why? So that we will be even more fruitful. So that we will be even be more fruitful. Are you ready to become more fruitful? I am. I am. But when he comes, I'm going to tell you straight up, when he comes for that limb that's hanging down, by, it's just hanging on, and he wants to pull that off, sometimes it's, sometimes it's hung on there. Sometimes it's rooted in pretty good. And when he goes to pulling on it, it hurts a little bit. Just know it's no good for you. He's just going to make something far better. Far better. The word renown. Renown is widespread and high repute. Fame. Favorable reputation. That's what God wants. He wants to be known like that. He wants to have that good reputation. So our examples are important. This is what I, this is what I wrote a while ago, and I had tucked away in here, and I guess it's for today. But I wrote, love must surpass knowledge. Knowledge is good, but allowing knowledge to lead us and not love, we have a problem. Knowledge puffs up and love lays us down. No greater love than this is that we lay down our lives for others. Love produces fruit, fruit that will last forever. Jesus says, you will be known as my disciples by your fruit, not by your knowledge. Correctly receiving the knowledge about Jesus Christ will draw us to love. When we were dead in our transgressions, simply living in a sinful manner, He still loved me. This is how we need to see someone who is still dead in their transgressions. There's new life coming. There's new life coming. Ephesians 3.19, we read it, but I just want to emphasize on it. It says, And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. To be filled. The only way you can be filled is to surrender. And having that fullness is taking up a position, fulfilling the purpose that God has. Where do, you, where do you lie in the purpose for God? I think you have, to, you have to recognize the gifts that God brings forth. There's three sets of gifts. And there's gifts from God. And they are, they are, found, in, they are found in Romans 12. You can write this down. There's gifts from the Holy Spirit. They are found in, Rome, in 1 Corinthians 12. And there's gifts from Jesus. They're found in Ephesians 4. Look them up and find yourself where am I at in the body of Christ. I spoke it over somebody. I said, I see you as an administrator. I left there and I was like, is that, is that even in your word? What did I do? I studied the gifts because I was implying a gift into that individual. Therefore, I'm responsible. And there's gifts of administration. I'm like, oh, it's right here. It is one of your gifts, Lord. 
Find yourself. But understand the love because God wants to be known. He wants to deepen our worship. Why? So he can clean us. Why? So we become more fruitful. We become more tasty. We become more attractive to people. That's what Jesus was. Jesus was amazing, and he still is today, and he will be forever and ever and ever. Lucas, if we could, I would all honestly like to end with the first song you guys sang. The first song. Yeah, if you would just go gather up Amy and just leave that setting in us. It's a call for the church. Yeah, I think I'm done.